So I know I have. Uh, and if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you probably have. It's not anything that's unusual for Christians to have their faith tested. So this morning we're going to talk about the testing of faith. And while we do that, uh, we're going to look, first of all, verses 1 through 12 are going to talk to us about the purpose of testing. God has a reason for it. It's not just happening to us out of God's control. He, he uses it for a purpose. And then verses 13 through 18 talk about the source of temptation. So there's testing, which God uses, and there's temptation, which comes and affects us in another way. So that, we'll, we'll be talking about that together uh, this morning. So in James chapter 1, I probably ought to turn there too. Uh, it's, it's the little five chapter letter right after Hebrews back in the New Testament. And if you get to 1st and 2nd Peter, it's just before that. And let me pray real quick for, the, for uh, us as we study the word together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, to open your word and study it, Lord. Lord, may you use it to study us and show us and equip us, encourage us, um, do the work that you need to do in our hearts. Lord, we might not, not even know what we need, really, but you do. And so may, may your will be done in us through this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so James begins, and, and again, I think we probably need to answer, ask the question, who is James? Because... There's quite a few James in the Bible, different guys. Um, but I, I'm not going to give you all the arguments of who says wh who, which James it is and why they believe that. I'm just going to tell you, I believe, and I think the majority of Bible scholars believe that this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote this letter. So with that in mind, I'm going to go on that assumption. That, that this is who, who it is. And it's interesting because James didn't really become that interested or even understand fully who Jesus was until after he saw Jesus uh, resurrected from the dead. Totally changed his mind. You know, this is my brother. Oh, he's perfect all the time. He never does anything wrong. But, and maybe he had that against Jesus. Who knows? But now that Jesus goes to the cross, he dies for our sins, he's put in the grave, and then he rises again, he's like, okay, there's something really unique about Jesus that he didn't get until that time. And so that's why when you read through the book of Acts and all these letters that Paul writes and others, how they talk about the resurrection from the dead. Jesus rose, Jesus rose. He didn't just die for our sins, and then that's it. But he rose from the dead, and he's seated at the Father's right hand right now. He's making intercession for us, and he's preparing a place for us where one day he'll receive us unto himself. And so James uh, becomes a leader in the early Christian church, and he calls himself here in verse 1, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, a bondservant. Now, what is a bond servant? For my studies, what I've learned is that a bond servant is someone who has been purchased and owned by a master or lord. Someone has authority over them. They are the servant of that, or slave, if you will, of someone over them. And in this case, who is it that James is a bond servant of? God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we see those words, of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, I think what James is saying here is that his service to God in serving Christ as Lord, he is serving God the Father. He is serving them. And then he tells us to the, whom the letter is written, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. Now, who are the 12 tribes? Well, what first probably comes to your mind are the 12 tribes of Israel. But it is out of those 12 tribes that God has redeemed people for himself. They've been saved. They've come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And at this point, there are believers now scattered all around the known world. And James is, in effect, saying to all believers everywhere who get this letter, to the Israel of God, in effect, all of the redeemed, wherever they are, this is a letter for you. And now this letter of James is, is really unique when you compare it to some of the other letters of Paul and John and Peter. James sort of seems to say something about this over here and then say something else about this and then say something else. And then he'll come back and he'll talk more about this and then that and then something else. And so James doesn't think a lot like we do here in the West as far as linearly. He, he'll talk about something and then he'll circle back. And, and talk about it again a little bit more. And we'll see that as we go through this study together. And then we come to verse 2, which is the one that sort of makes us go, huh? Because look what it says. He says, my brethren, he's talking to the believers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. That seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? I mean, when, when trials come your way, do you, are you like, yay, this is great, I'm so happy. I don't think that's what we normally do. We're like, oh no, here we go. And we kind of reluctantly go into them, and I know that, let's just be honest, we don't like them. They're not fun. Um, but we're supposed to count it all joy. Uh, why should we count it all joy? Well, I think, if just, just kind of listen to me here. If, if you knew what God was doing behind it all, if you could see things from God's perspective behind the, the trial that you're going through, uh, then maybe you'd see it a little bit differently. So he says, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. He, he doesn't say if. We know that if's not true. When? Because they're coming. And, and they'll probably come your whole life, in some harder than others, some bigger than others. Uh, but, but when you fall into various trials, and, and every one of you here lifted your hand while ago and said, yep, been there, been through them. Some of you might be going through it right now. In some form or fashion there's a trial that you're facing it could be just really you know not very big but for some of you it could really be like this is huge in my life right now so if, if I could help you today to sort of get God's perspective on it maybe that would help you and in verse 3 he gives us the purpose for testing he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Apparently that's something we all need and we don't have enough of because it seems like we're tested quite often. And I think it seems like, you know, when we're young Christians, we're tested in these things and God builds our patience. And then we're tested in another area and our patience gets even more tested. And then another, and our patience grows even more. And some of us now are saying, I'm really patient. But God's saying, not enough. You need to be more patient. So uh, the testing of your faith produces patience. He says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You need to know that. Don't, don't just forget that. Don't just, just let that you know, slip away from your memory. Know that God has a purpose for the testing that comes into your life. In fact, in verse 4, he says, but let patience have its perfect work. That's what my version, the New King James said. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So as you let patience work itself into your life as you become more patient he says uh, that you may be perfect 
some of your Bibles read the word mature there. That you might grow. That you might uh, become more uh, I don't know, grown up about the things that you're facing. Have a different perspective. You might be perfect, mature. And then he says um, complete. In other words, your entire life at that point, um, God is, is bringing you to completeness. He's not going to leave you there because he's got more for you, but he will make you complete so that you are lacking nothing. In other words, at that point, there's nothing else you need. You can't improve upon it. He's giving you what you need right now. So if you can trust God in the good times, please know that you can also trust him in the bad times because he's doing something. He's whittling away at your life. He's doing something for his glory in you. And if you don't understand that, that's why in verse 5 he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. In other words, do you lack wisdom regarding this whole testing? Do you need to understand better why God is doing it or what he's trying to do in your life? He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So if you lack wisdom, what are you supposed to do? Ask God for it. That's, that's the promise right here. It says, if you ask God for it, he will give it to you. He is the source of all wisdom. And he gives it not only to you, but he gives it to you liberally. He's very generous with his wisdom. He will give it to you and help you understand that. But not only that, he gives it approvingly. God loves it when we rely upon him. That's what the word without reproach means. That God is giving it to you. He, he wants to give it to you. He, he wants to give it to you without anything back. He, he wants you just to rely upon him. And the fact is we need this heavenly wisdom. Because when we get over into James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, he talks about wisdom again. And he talks about how heavenly wisdom is different from earthly wisdom. And so just, you know, you might want to read ahead sometime and see what he says there. And so what happens then is as we face life's problems and trials, as we gain wisdom about it, we are able to put life's problems into proper perspective and make God-pleasing choices. And then in verse 6, he he admonishes us. He says, but let, let him ask in faith. Ask If you're going to ask for wisdom, ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. So as you ask God for wisdom, there is a condition for you to meet. And it is that you ask with no doubting. And I don't want you to misunderstand what he's talking about here as far as doubting. He's not talking about, I don't know if God will give it or not. The doubting has more of an emphasis on what you believe about God. In other words, in this case, it refers to a fundamental lack of faith and the integrity and the goodness of God. That you're thinking, God's not going to follow through. God is not going to... Uh, I can't rely on God, basically, is what you're saying. And it leads you into disobedience and disloyalty. And because you don't rely upon God, because you have doubt about God's faithfulness, he describes you in the rest of verse 6. He who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Any of you ever been on a boat or a ship out in the ocean in a storm? I've been on a cruise once. First one I ever went on, it was rough the first night. And we were about to get sick. I mean, it was bad. And, and I know that it's probably worse if we were in a smaller boat. It would have been terrible. 
But when you think about the ocean and the wind and the waves dri driving the boat and tossing you about, it's stormy, it's unstable, it's dangerous, and it impedes your progress. And so if, if you don't have faith that God's going to be faithful and God's going to keep his word and God's going to be who he always is, which we'll get to that in a minute, then you're going to be, your life is going to be tumultuous. And you know what? I think that's, that says a lot about where we are as a country today. All these shootings, all the political chaos that's going on, all of the, uh, uh, the, I don't know, you know, it, a lot of it started with the pandemic, with people not knowing what to believe, uh, whether masks work or not, or whether the vaccination was good to get or not, and, and then rioting, and looting, and all of the things that it seems like have kind of come since that point, it's like people have no solid ground to stand on. They don't know what to believe. And they're like ships floating out on the sea at the mercy of the wind, whatever's, whichever wind's blowing the strongest. When their anchor needs to be in Jesus, in God, and in his word, instead of at the mercy of everything else. And so, um, if, if, you, if you question the integrity and the goodness of God, verse 7 says, For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. And it refers to him as a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. That means he has a divided loyalty. Well, sometimes having God in your life is a good thing. It works for you. It's very pragmatic. Sometimes, eh, I don't need the church stuff and God. Right now, I'm just going to turn and rely on myself or the government or something else to, to help me through life. And you have a, a double mind, your divided loyalty between seeking God first and then seeking something else first. Where, our, our, where we should land is always staying faithful to God in spite of what everyone else is saying. Let's not have a, a contrary blend of, of desires in our lives. In other words, there, there are people who on the one hand, at one minute they're carnal, the next minute they're spiritual. One minute they're talk, concerned about pleasure, and the next they're concerned about virtue. They're concerned about self, they're concerned about God. They're caught up in the flesh, but then they want to go to things of the spirit. They're uh, they're doing things James refers to as the law that brings the law of death into effect versus the law of life. They have the wisdom from below versus the wisdom from above. But that's chaos. That's not being grounded and rooted in the word of God and letting God shape your life and guide your life. We all need to understand that the testing of our faith is a pathway to a mature faith and it takes wisdom and faith in God to endure. So that's the purpose of, of, for of the testing of our faith. And then we come to verses 9 through 11, where we see that the trials of our faith affect rich and poor alike. You can't buy your way out of trials. I mean, some people, they, money can do a lot of things, don't get me wrong. And it might, it might combine your happiness for a while but it's not going to last but the trials of faith affect rich and poor alike and death also comes to rich and poor alike every rich person that's ever lived uh, except for those living right now have died every poor person that's ever lived except for those living right now have died so uh, death comes to all, rich and poor alike. And, and here in verse 9 it says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. So this is a brother. These are brothers in the faith. The rich brother and the poor brother. The lowly poor brother should glory that it's only going to get better. 
right? This isn't all there is to life. It's going to get better. Heaven awaits and he will be exalted when he goes to be with the Lord. The rich brother, let's continue reading here, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower fails, and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. So the rich brother needs to humble himself and admit that he needs the Lord. He can't buy his way into heaven. The ground is level at the cross. There's no advantage to having money and means there at the cross. It doesn't avail for you. It's going to buy you nothing because salvation is free. You, you just have to realize that you need it. And so sometimes those with means and money need to be taken down a notch. They need to be humbled, and it's too easy for them to trust in their wealth, power, ability, and influence. You don't have to turn there, but I want you to at least write the verse down. 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 through 19. I want you to listen to these verses. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Here's what Paul tells Timothy. He says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Amen. That's what we need to do. Rich, don't trust in the uncertainty of riches. So the rich must live by faith. They can't just rely on their riches to avail for them. Salvation is free, but Christianity costs you everything. Mm -hmm. Rich and poor alike are commanded to deny themselves, to take up their cross, and to follow Christ. And you might remember Jesus said that it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So the distinguished position that the rich now enjoy will disappear in the kingdom of God. The world in its present form is passing away, the Bible says. Heaven's going to be different. Well, let's look at verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Folks, God is working in your life and uses trials to increase your faith and to grow your patience. And throughout our entire lives as Christians, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God is working in us to sanctify us, to make us holy, to make us more like Christ. He's teaching us how to trust in Him in everything that we do. And the day will come when we've been approved and after we've stood the test, James tells us here that we will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love Him. Trials have a way of separating the pure from the phony. God's people persevere to the end. They don't fall short. They might, they might backslide and fall into sin through neglect and temptation, but a true believer will not remain in such a condition. The Lord won't let them. The Holy Spirit will convict them of sin, and they could also come under the spiritual discipline of the Lord so that they would repent of their sin and return to the Lord. So let's, let's talk about now the source of temptation in verse 13 through the rest of the chapter, or rest of uh, verse 18. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. That's pretty clear. Don't attribute evil motives to God. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone to do evil. So if you're being tempted to 
you do something that's sinful, guess what? It's not from God. It's not coming from Him. In fact, God cannot be tempted by evil. God Himself cannot sin. Why can't God be tempted? Well, because He doesn't lack anything. He doesn't need anything. He isn't missing out on anything whereby that would tempt Him. Uh, he's perfect and righteous and holy. He's self-sufficient. He's satisfied in himself. So he cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone else to do evil. But verse 14 begins to tell us how temptation works. It says, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his what? His own desires and enticed. In other, in other words, we're drawn away from trusting God by our own desires when we are enticed by an internal pull that does not come from God. It comes from within us. It's our own desires. Jesus said, it's not what goes into the man that defiles him, it's what comes out of him. For out of the heart of man proceeds evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, and wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness, all of these evil things proceed from within and defile a man. So we're drawn away. We are drawn away by our own desires and enticed. And then verse 15 says, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So when the sinful desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin gives birth to death. So first, there's the, the thought, there's the idea, there's the seed. And then there's the act, or the deed. And then there's the consequence, which is death. You see, contrary to what you might believe, or what the devil might want you to believe, sin does not enhance your life. Sin does not bring about good. The Bible says that sin brings about death. And sin brings rot, ruin, and decay wherever it happens. So don't be deceived. In other words, that's what verse 15 says, or 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. In other words, don't be tricked into attributing an evil motivation to God. Don't think that God is making you sin. He's certainly not. So don't be tricked into that. Because, verse 17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. So where do the good and perfect things come from? Up there, from God. The Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. So the, the, the character of God is such that only good things come from Him. You have to believe that. The, the key difference between testing and tempting, you need to listen to this. The difference between testing and tempting is that God's motive is to build character and patience into you. Satan's motive is to entice you to sin. That's the difference. And you can be sure that God doesn't change. Not God's not going to be uh, pure, righteous, and holy one day, and then the next day God is unrighteous and evil. God doesn't change. God does not adapt. His standard stays the same because he stays the same. His word does not change. Neither time, culture, nor laws that man might create can change the truth of God, his will, and his ways. God is consistent. He's unchangeable. The theologians call him immutable. There's no variation in him. He's not two-faced or double-tongued. God is constant and reliable. He who he is, what he says, and what he does is true and right. Okay. In fact, I got an email the other day. There was a survey that was taken by Ligonier Ministries. It was called the State of Theology. 
It's, the, it's a survey they took. And one of the questions that they put to people who claim to be evangelicals, the statement was this, God learns and adapts to different circumstances. I'm saying, nope, no way. God doesn't change. He doesn't need to learn anything. He already knows everything from beginning to end. He doesn't adapt. Only people who adapt better be us. But about 50% of people who claim to be evangelicals said that God adapts and learns. That sounds more like Mormonism than Christianity. So, but God does not change. I mean, it's clear here. It's clear in Hebrews 13 where Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Amen. And so, as we think about God being who he is and what he says and what he does, always being true and right, in verse 17 and verse 18, which is our last verse, in contrast to death, birth by sin, life is produced by God. Look at verse 18. It says, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. That we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So God brought us forth by, like we talked about last week, a grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone, into this faith wherein you stand. By the word of truth. God's word does God's work to make, to bring us into God's kingdom. So what happened one day is you saw God for who he is and you saw yourself for who you were and you knew you were in trouble. You knew you needed a savior. You needed to be rescued. So you called for God to have mercy on you through Jesus Christ. And guess what? God is faithful. God said, Yes, I will rescue you. I am coming to you. I'm going to save you. We have faith in God because God gave us spiritual life. Let me mention four scriptures. I'm not going to read them right now. I know we're going over. But let me read them right up and give you the references right now. If you're a note taker, write them down. This has to do with God's word bringing faith about in our lives. 1 Peter 1.23 Ephesians 1.13 John 1, 12 and 13 and 2 Thessalonians 2.13 I'll read them again. 1 Peter 1.23 Ephesians 1.13 John 1, 12 and 13, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. There's a lot of 13s in there. But God considers us, according to verse 18, the first fruits of his creatures. And, and I'll just tell you what that is. It refers to those who have been set apart for God as his special possession. It's, it's a gift. We are gifts to God. And so today we talked about the testing of our faith. We talked about the purpose of the testing and the source of temptation. And so whenever you face various trials, what are you supposed to do? Count it all joy. God is working on you. No one likes surgery. Anybody ever had surgery before? Yeah. I have. It can hurt. But if it's done correctly, it can really help you. So something that can hurt can also help. Trust that God can use circumstances and in the midst of them, take his word, which is sharper than any double-edged sword, and do the spiritual surgery that you need to have in those circumstances. He knows what you need. He'll give you patience so that you'll be made mature, complete, lacking in nothing. You might need wisdom when you're going through those difficult times. Ask God for wisdom and he'll give it to you. Trust him. Ask in faith. Don't doubt God's genuine offer. He won't deceive you. And no matter whether you're rich or poor, 
You need faith to please the Lord. Neither your lack of abundance, your lack of abundance or your excess will avail you before God. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ for everyone. Doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. What you have or don't have doesn't commend you to God. And then finally, trust God. Don't give in to temptation. God is good. He doesn't change despite whatever lie you might hear otherwise. And he brought you to faith through his word. And he who began this good work in you, bringing you to faith, will be faithful to complete it. So learn more of God, get in his word, and grow in your faith. That's James 1, 1 through 18. And Lord willing, next week we'll start at verse 19 and we'll go from there. But let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And I pray that what has been shared will be helpful, will be encouraging, and uh, will be instructive. Uh, Lord, I don't know what everyone's going through here, but I know that we all can't go through it and learn what we need to without you. So Lord, thank you for your presence with us as we go through it. Lord, increase our faith and help us to use what we learn to be more faithful, effective followers of you. 